Thank you. So, the title of my talk, I felt her pulse, her meter pulse inside my own brain. Um, it's a line from an essay by the contemporary American poet Annie Finch. Um, and before I start, I actually just wanted to see, can you raise your hand if you know who, who that is? Anyone? Hat maybe? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? Yes, it is. It's a 19th century poet, Amer uh, Emily Dickinson. Um, and so the essay that I'm looking at um, and I'm talking about today is called My Father Dickinson on Poetic Influence. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about who she is in a bit. Um, but in this essay, uh, Finch writes really beautifully about her experience reading another writer. And not just reading, but really entering into this profound relationship with the work. Um, so the line I quote from comes from a passage about the way Finch feels when she's reading um, Dickinson's writing. Um, and it, it represents this kind of intimate reading and identification that I'm interested in in my dissertation research. Um, it's a relationship between a living writer and a dead one that surpasses a kind of scholarly interest or casual sort of reader's appreciation. Um, so this is Annie Finch on the left. Um, it's, this passage is from a moment in her life she, uh, when she's a graduate student in a creative writing workshop. She's reading a Dickinson poem as part of the workshop. So she writes, I sat there with the sun casting looming rectangles over the page on my lap and in an instant felt as if I were completely in Emily's head. I felt her meter, her words pulse under my hands and her awe and pain pulse inside my own heart. I felt an understanding of her as a woman and even more as a peer with all her frustration, her fear, her powerlessness and her courage. As before, it seemed like she was with me, feeling my pain as a woman poet, and also finally giving me a gift. Again, she was my sister and my father. The idea for my book, The Ghost of Meter, was born in that moment. So what I really love about this passage is the way it captures a moment of recognition, an instant in which Dickinson, the dead poet, becomes not just understandable, but really familiar to Finch, the living poet. She begins to speak to Finch as a sister or a father, a woman, not just a text. The two women's bodies merge completely so that Dickinson's words, which are also her pulse, her life force, are hammering beneath uh, Finch's hands, and Dickinson's suffering is felt within Finch's own body. The pain, which is specifically female, is also a gift. A book is born. So going back, uh, Emily Dickinson is one of the major poets of American literature. She was born in 1830 in Amherst, Massachusetts, um, and her work was never published during her lifetime. So she's often imagined as this kind of isolated spinster looking sadly out of her window in a white dress with the New England snow. Um, but actually she wrote a lot of, she wrote many letters and she was in constant contact with a lot of the major writers and scholars of the time. Uh, and she's also living in Massachusetts at a really interesting time when a lot of the most important American writers of the century were there. People like Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Emerson, and Louisa May Alcott, who wrote Little Women, if anyone said that. Um, but Dickinson is one of the few female poets still read from that time, so she's been picked up by a lot of different people and claimed, um, including by a lot of different feminist scholars and women writers who are looking for a sort of origin point in their nation's history. Um, and also, because she is one of the few women included in the canon, uh, and canon here just refers to a group of writers who've been selected by scholars as being the most important and influential. So because she's one of the few women in that canon, she's also um, seen as being part of this sort of, this tradition that by its nature is elitist and kind of claimed by them. So that's a little context on what Finch was talking about when she said Dickinson was her sister and father, because she's actually introducing Finch to a male tradition, not a female one. Um, but another important aspect of Finch's essay is that she describes her relationship to Dickinson, um, this kind of radical merging, uh, as having to do not just with the words she's reading, but um, with a sense of shared trauma. So in an unusual uh, kind of move for a scholarly essay, Finch writes about her own experience of childhood sexual trauma and claims, like this isn't in any of the biographies, that Dickinson had the same experience. And she sees the proof of this not in anything that's been written about Dickinson, but in the words themselves. So I've included um, the, poem that, ooh, the poem that Finch was reading um, when she first saw this connection. It's called I Died for Beauty, But Was Scarce. I died for beauty, but was scarce, adjusted in the tomb, 
when one who died for truth was laying in an adjoining room. He questioned softly why I failed. For beauty, I replied. And I for truth, themselves are one. We brethren are, he said. And so as kinsmen met a night, we talked between the rooms until the moss had reached our lips and covered up our names. So one of the most obvious things about Dickinson is that she has this very strange kind of punctuation and capitalization in the middle of sentences. Um, and that's the manuscript, it's her handwriting. Um, so uh, if it seems kind of contradictory and strange, it, it is. Um, but the poem is often read as an imaginative meditation on death. So it's the fact that we can understand death only through our own lived circumstances. Um, but uh, because she's sort of notoriously difficult to read, it's pretty hard to pin down exactly what any of her poems mean. So this is, everyone just kind of is guessing, suggesting possibilities. So Finch is guessing too, but for her, the poem acts in a way that's almost opposite to the sort of traditional reading. Um, she's claiming that Dickinson is using death in the poem as a metaphor to express the feelings of the poet as a living subject uh, and a traumatized subject. So she's not talking about literal death, but metaphorical death. Uh, and she also writes that she thinks the poem is written from the point of view of a man because of the poet's use of the word kinsmen. Um, she writes, if I had to sum it up and all up in one quality, it was that uncanny sense of death and life that Dickinson seemed to share with me that hooked me and that drew me finally into her poetry. I had died for beauty too, for the beauty of a young girl's vulnerability. And when I woke up hesitantly and moved my eyes around the inside of my tomb, the only kinship I found there, the only poet who spoke of my frozen consciousness was Dickinson's. Come on, she was saying, it's not so hard to be a man. So she's using some of the same words from the poem here. You've got tomb, kinship, and beauty. Um, but even though Dickinson is appealing to Finch's sense of a particularly female kind of loss, she makes it sound like Dickinson's actually helping her to embrace maleness in the sort of male tradition. And she says, it was only Dickinson who made me feel that I could be what I considered a male poet too, that I could write about serious subjects from a serious point of view without having to take others into account. So in degendering herself, sort of taking away that femaleness, um, Finch is arguing that Dickinson is being subversive and writing with a kind of freedom that Finch wants for herself as well. Uh, from a sort of feminist contemporary point of view, it would kind of, it would be better or sort of fit more neatly uh, if Finch could find a way of being a woman writer and also writing about serious subjects from a serious point of view. But um, it's hard to begrudge her for that kind of limitation. So I'm going to move out now and tell you a little bit about the broader debate about literary influence. And hopefully starting with Finch will start, uh, kind of be a good demonstration of the way many forms of writing do and don't fit into this debate. So in a way, um, the question of influence is kind of an old fashioned one. Uh, and the theories I'm going to talk about today are relatively old, at least if you're working in contemporary literature. Um, but at, at its most basic, literary influence is just the way writers are affected by other writers. Um, so in formulating theories of influence, scholars are trying to figure out how writers relate to each other, how influence is transmitted between them, and what that means in terms of understanding these works as part of a larger tradition or not. So I'm gonna start with T.S. Eliot. Um, he is one of the earliest and most important theorists of influence in the modern contemporary period, whose work is still basically relevant. Um, he was an American modernist who later became a British citizen. Um, that's him at Virginia Woolf's house in East Sussex. Um, and he's best known for his poems, The Wasteland, it's on the left, and The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and that is a graphic novel version of The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which I would recommend looking up online if you're interested. Um, so the Eliot essay I'm going to talk about is called uh, Tradition and the Individual Talent. Um, it was published in a book called The Sacred Wood in 1920. The essay deals with the problem of establishing a tradition in English literature, and it tries to understand what the relationship is between the poet and his history, which Eliot seems, uh, sees in terms of European and American history, so not just the individual nation, but definitely not the whole world, um, and the relationship between the poet and his predecessors. Um, here it's, no poet, no artist of any art has his complete meaning alone. His significance, his appreciation, is the appreciation of his relation to the dead poets and artists. 
So it's pretty uncontroversial in that way. You know, the artist doesn't stand alone. He has to be understood in terms of everything that came before him. Uh, Eliot objects to the idea that the poet must be ridiculously well-read, but he does argue that the poet has to develop or procure the consciousness of the past. So he has to have some sense of the literature that came before him. Um, in doing so, the poet experiences, quote there, um, a continual surrender of himself as he is at the moment to something which is more valuable. The progress of the artist is a continual self-sacrifice, a continual extinction of personality. And this is interesting because it's kind of a weird thing to say, at least from a male theorist in Western art, um, that the artist is surrendering himself and kind of um, effacing himself in, in some, for something larger. And it actually sounds a lot more like the work of um, some female mystics from 20th century and earlier, some of whom Eliot did read. Um, so in some ways, it's a sort of feminine idea. But as if responding to that, Eliot goes on to explain why his theory, which is an impersonal theory of poetry, is actually like science. So science is more masculine, um, like as if he's trying to separate himself from this, um, this feminine melting away of self. So he writes, it is in this depersonalization that art may be said to approach the condition of science. The mind of poet is the shred of platinum. It may partly or exclusively operate upon the experience of the man himself. But the more perfect the artist, the more completely separate in him will be the man who suffers and the mind which creates. So the experiences you have in your life matter. Um, the mind is maybe working partially based on what you've seen and done, um, but the better the artist, the more his work will be completely divorced from the actual experiences he's had as a person. Um, this is obviously a problem for writers like Finch from the beginning who see their life histories and their identities as really central to the work that they make. Um, the second big theorist of influence I'm going to talk about is Harold Bloom. Um, just to get it out of the way, I, I really don't like Harold Bloom. His work is just, it's so like masculine and kind of misogynistic. And he's also a Fulbright scholar at Pembroke in 1953 and apparently hated it. So obviously that's a strike against him. Um, but for a sense of Bloom's standing in the literary world, uh, recent articles on him have been entitled Harold Bloom is God, which is published in a Jewish magazine, which I think is kind of sacrilegious. Um, <laughs> And in a recent article by a Cambridge professor, the immortal Harold Bloom, the greatest literary critic on the planet. Bloom is best known for his book, The Anxiety of Influence, on the left there. And that was published in 1973. The book sets up a theory of influence in which strong poets necessarily misread their predecessors in order to clear imaginative space for themselves. So Bloom casts this relation between contemporary poet and the past poet as a kind of battle between fathers and sons. Uh, and he writes, my concern is only with strong poets, major figures, with the persistence to wrestle with their strong precursors, even to the death. Uh, weaker talents idealize figures of capable imagination appropriate for themselves. And he goes on to say, battle between strong equals, father and son as mighty opposites. That's my only subject here. So the struggle, and for Bloom it's like a really violent physical struggle, is also seen as a narrative of masculine maturity. So he writes, even though the strongest poets were at first weak, they, for they started uh, as prospective atoms, as in Adam and Eve. Uh, as the poet matures and ages, he learns to take on the threatening figures of his poetic tradition, and his misreading, or misprison, as Bloom calls it, becomes an articulation of his own movement into manhood. And there are some obvious problems with this theory, and it's worth noting that Annie Finch from the beginning, who wrote so personally and so peacefully about Dickinson's influence on her, was herself a student of Bloom's as an undergraduate at Yale. She wrote, maybe unsurprisingly, that as an undergraduate she had difficulties with Bloom because, she writes, I felt as a woman so shut out of his theories. But the statement also ends by admitting a little reluctantly that maybe Bloom was a little bit right sometimes. Uh, and this is kind of the frustration for me, at least, about Bloom is that he kind of seems like a jerk, and his theories are so obviously just at and about white men. But at the same time, every once in a while, he's kind of right. Um, so anyway, the things to take away from Bloom are influence is a violent struggle, and the struggles between sons and fathers representing poets of the past and poets now. So the last theory I'm going to look at is from Betsy Erkula. She's a professor of English at Northwestern University in Chicago. 
Um, Urkel is much less of a mythologized figure than the other two. And I actually, I couldn't even find a really a good picture of her. So this is one of her books. Um, but I, I don't want to suggest that her work is actually on the same level as the other two. Because the essay I'm going to talk about is from 1984, and it just hasn't had the same kind of um, impact that the other two theories have. Um, rather, her essay, Dickinson and Rich, Sort of Theory of Female Poetic Influence, represents a kind of feminist, broader feminist response to this very masculine, century-long debate about influence. So Urkula's essay starts with Bloom, and kind of has to, in a way. He's still such a formidable figure. Um, she argues that while other feminist scholars have applied Bloom's theory to female models, they haven't actually changed the validity of the theory itself, or considered how this family romance that he describes between um, son and father, the poets of past and present, might change if they were women. So Urkula sets out to establish a new model using mythological relationships between mothers and daughters, as well as the real relationship between Emily Dickinson, who we started with, and Adrian Rich, who's a contemporary American poet who was born 45 years um, after Dickinson's death. So these are um, drawings of them from a book. That's Emily Dickinson on the right, Rich on the left, and a colonial poet in Bradstreet in the middle. Um, so Urkula writes, in response to their poetic mothers, American women poets often experience neither a Bloomian anxiety of influence nor an anxiety of authorship. By defining themselves in relation to rather than in relation, uh, reaction against each other, these women poets reverse the pattern of male relationship. So Urkula argues her case by showing, uh, very convincingly I think, um, how Rich, like the poet Annie Finch, found her way to poetic maturity with the help of Dickinson. So she moves from the sort of mild, uh, obedient girl poet whose work was really accepted by male traditionalists to this radical lesbian, strident Jewish feminist that she became known as. And you have little labels if you were confused. Um, so Urkula writes that about Rich as a young poet, that eager to be sufficiently universal and thus non-female, uh, Rich imitated the style of her male masters. She had not yet discovered her female experience as a subject for poetry and a source of poetic power. Through reading and embracing Dickinson, then, Urkula writes, Rich becomes able to give birth to herself as the subject and source of her poetry. So there's, there's a lot to say about that, but I think uh, Urkula does forge important new ground in scholarship on poetic influence among women. But at the same time, she kind of is doing what she accuses everyone else of doing, in that um, she's taking a lot of the underlying principles for granted and just kind of changing the details. Um, so what she doesn't challenge is as interesting to me as what, what she does. So she, in ways that she does challenge, she's saying, unlike Eliot, relationships between poets are really intimate and, and totally personal, um, connected to the personal life of the poet. So Adrienne Rich's midlife uh, embrace of her own identity as a Jewish lesbian goes hand in hand with a transition into a mature and radical poet. Um, and unlike Bloom, Urkula also sees the relationship between poets, at least between women poets, because she doesn't exactly map out what happens if uh, a woman poet is influenced by a male poet outside of this oppressive model. But between two women poets, the relationship uh, in her eyes, it's not producing anxiety, but releasing the poets from anxiety. What she doesn't challenge, though, and this is how Bloom's idea kind of lives on, is this idea that writers have to relate to each other as family members. Like, this is the only relationship that there could be between an older woman and a younger woman, which is especially weird in the case of Rich, who's a lesbian. But, um, so there's this kind of family relationship, and then also this, this need to, to hold on to this metaphor of female creative output as childbirth. Would obviously, for a lot of women, motherhood's not the most important event in their life or part of their life. And Rich herself wrote about her children in this really guilty way, um, writing in her journal in 1960, my children caused me the most exquisite suffering. It is the suffering of ambivalence, which I don't think she would have written about her poetry. Um, so is childbearing the only way that even feminist scholars have found to talk about female influence in creative production? You know, you wonder about the sort of merging of bodies that you see in Annie Finch's article, or this transformative power of shared trauma across time and space. Is there a way to think about the ways women write to and after each other that doesn't rely on either of these metaphors? There has to be. So that's kind of the jumping off point for my dissertation research. Um, so I hope that this has given you a sense of sort of
the ongoing debate about literary influence in American writers and who those key players are. Thank you.